I'm sorry, Al. I, I just feel really weird at the moment. I swear we've done this before. Like, exactly. In the past? Yeah. No. Maybe in the future? It's like deja vu, but worse. Right, sorry. How are you today, Al? Your chronometer is malfunctioning. In other words, you're as confused as I am. Well, at least I'm not the only one. So what's on the agenda today? And why is Bob in a box back there? Oh, Bob got fired. How? I see, he spent his entire museum budget ordering trees. So that's why there are so many of them in the hallways. He thinks he was setting them free from captivity. Well, at least he has a good intention. Dynamic armatures? What do you mean? Oh, right, the lesson. We're moving on to dynamic armatures. You know, Al... I really feel like this whole lesson is out of sequence, though. Like, we have covered half of our lessons together, but before this ever happened. Are you sure we are only on armatures? Okay, okay, I don't doubt you. Let's dive into it, then. Ah, perfect, a chalkboard. You see, Al, design is intention. If you are having trouble determining how to analyze or construct a composition, one of the best ways is to look at the armature of the artwork. Good question. Armatures are just a fancy term for the layout of a painting. Think of it as scaffolding for a good composition. This happens behind the scenes as the artist creates their work. By starting with a grid or an armature, a grid being the most basic type of armature, the artist can lay out the central focal point of their work and then build up from there. This makes it easier to ensure that the final work is dynamic and engaging to the viewer, especially if it uses dynamic symmetry. When analyzing a work, identifying these armatures and grids can help to point out specific attributes of a painting. There are a few reasons why grids and dynamic armatures are useful. Firstly, they are efficient. They assist the artist in creating visual flow by determining the placement and position of subject matter long before imagery is selected or created. They permit the artist to build from a strong, logical foundation, helping to take the guesswork out of compositional design. Secondly, they lead to consistent work. Grids and dynamic armatures are based on ratios. Therefore, they are never arbitrary. This helps to create relationships automatically inside of the painting's composition, and this leads to structural harmony as a result. Lastly, using grids and armatures allows for continuity within artworks. Even when the grids and armatures are unseen, the viewer will still get the sense that there is order underlying the piece. This underlying order adds to the overall continuity of the work, and promotes Gestalt Law within the work. What do you mean, what is Gestalt Law? You know Gestalt Law. The rules, remember? We, we discussed that already. Or did we? Anyway, I have a feeling you'll learn about them soon enough from me, I think. Regardless, using grids and armatures leads to continuity within the work. So let's discuss grids. A basic grid is comprised of rows and columns. Modules are created within these rows and columns. A module is simply the number of squares within a grid. The more modules, the more possible grid combinations available. For example, if we have a 2x2 two two grid, then there are 4 modules. This means that it contains 16 possible combinations. The larger the grid, the more this grows. For example, a 10x10 ten ten grid yields 10,000 possible combinations. You can determine the possible combinations rather simply. Take the dimensions of your grid, say x times y. This gives you the number of total modules in the grid. Each of these modules have one of two possible states, either on or off. This means that your number of modules will be squared. 
Doing so illustrates the possible combinations available to you using a grid of those dimensions. Grids create interesting works of art, although somewhat limited. These works tend to have a great deal of dynamic tension and rhythm to them. Grids can also be used to create simple but strong points of emphasis. Just like when you painted over that artwork during our lesson about hierarchies. What? Again? You seriously don't remember that. I can't understand why time feels so jumbled today. Anyway, look at this piece titled Agnes by Chuck Close. Close is a master at using the grid. He uses gridding almost exclusively in laying out his work. Underlying these massive portraits are large grids that allow Close to enlarge his Polaroid reference material. In addition to this, we see Close using each of these grids as a miniature abstract color study. The result is a digital feeling that is both varied but unified, and which oddly enough comes together in a way that feels cohesive to the overall large image. A technique that is not unlike the optical mixing employed by pixels on modern screens or in the points in classical pointillist works. It is important that we note that our discussion so far has been about basic grids, as we are about to discuss dynamic grids next, which are completely different. So let's talk about dynamic symmetry and its relationship to dynamic rectangles, armatures, and grids. As we stated before, the dynamic armature is the underlying component used in the creation of a composition or design. Its borders form the outside edges of the work. In other words, the picture's frame. The dynamic armature and grid differ from the basic grid in a couple of key areas. First, the dynamic armature and grid is based on geometric principles. It must be formed within the confines of an aspect ratio. This aspect ratio is the proportional relationship between the width and height of the mother rectangle. This aspect ratio is what determines the construction of the armature itself. This is different than the basic grid systems, which are just uniform divisions of space. Yeah, it sounds like some kind of alien craft, doesn't it? The mother rectangle. Huh. I see we keep getting new robots here all the time. Anyway, back to business. The second difference is that the dynamic armature allows for the dynamic and proportional creation of key lines that run parallel or perpendicular to the picture frame. As these lines intersect, they do so only on perfectly proportioned points of interest, also known as eyes. This process is what forms our dynamic grid. So, you get it? The armature is the whole layout, and the grid is the broken down system within that layout. Good. In dynamic symmetry, the armatures are made on dynamic rectangles, such as root rectangles, and of course the golden rectangle, which we already know about from our other lesson on the subject. You don't know what I'm talking about. Really. Again with this deja vu thing? This can't be a coincidence. Anyway, the long and short of the golden rectangle is that it follows the golden ratio, otherwise known as phi. This is a really important numerical value and deals with a rectangular space that when the long side of the rectangle is divided by the short side, the resulting solution is 1.618. This golden ratio is important because it was heralded in antiquity as being the most pleasing to the eye and is still a great source of inspiration to artists today. All of this also ties into the numerical sequence known as the Fibonacci sequence. You know who Fibonacci is? The soccer player. Oh no, 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 no. We're repeating eggs now. Okay, <laughs> Let, let's just move on. So dynamic rectangles are simply ones which retain their symmetry when subdivided. Like with the golden rectangle, root rectangles follow ratios. In these cases, the longer side of the rectangle to the shorter side of the rectangle is the square root of a particular number. You see, as the root increases, the steepness of the angle from corner to corner decreases. This can help you determine the right proportions for your canvases, as you may want a steeper angle in your work, or you may not. This is also something to consider when analyzing artworks, as the steepness of both the Baroque and sinister angles can greatly impact the painting's composition. You don't know what the Baroque and sinister angles are? They're just fancy terms for the angles that go from the bottom left to the top right, which is the Baroque angle, and the angle which goes from the top left to the bottom right, the sinister angle. You should remember this from our lesson on... Right. Timey-wimey nonsense. Never mind then. Ratios and roots are very important in art, and in contemporary media, as they impact the way in which we perceive visual information. Take for instance a ratio of 1 to 1. This is a square. Squares in our contemporary society are commonly associated with things like album art. 
They are pleasing in their composition, provided that the iconography fits comfortably into the space and doesn't feel cropped in a way that loses vital information. This, compared to something like the Golden Ratio, will have a completely different feeling to it. Those works set into the Golden Ratio or Golden Rectangle will have a much more classical feel to them. They will also be very pleasing to the eye. Thus, smart use of this can help artists add more visual appeal and classicism to their works. In stark contrast is something like a composition set in Route 3. This is equivalent to a ratio of 16 to 9. This is a very important ratio in contemporary society, as this ratio is normally used in digital media, from screens on computers to HD TVs to cell phone screens. Thus, works set into this ratio are going to have a great deal of contemporary familiarity, and might lead to some underlying messages about our digital culture. Likewise, a Root 5 composition will feel very cinematic, as it is much wider than tall, a ratio of 21 to 9. This will give the work a very different scope and feel, and could again be used to give the work a contemporary feel. Here's a list of the most common ratios. You'll notice that many of them fall into common sizes for artist substrates like paper or canvases. Though this knowledge is most ideally used by the artist in a custom way, where the artist is sizing their substrate on a piece-by-piece -piece basis. As you might have guessed, using armatures and rectangles is really important in the creation of art, but can also be very important in deciphering art for analysis. We already discussed how some ratios feel more contemporary than others, but we can take this further as the use of the armatures and rectangles helps us to identify structures and arrangements within paintings which affect the compositional rhythm, energy, and unity. Excellent suggestion, Al. I think it will be easier to understand all this if we construct an armature together. An armature can be made on any rectangle. However, it is usually done on dynamic rectangles, such as the golden rectangle and root rectangles. When an armature is built on a dynamic rectangle, it then becomes a dynamic armature. The resulting grid is then also known as a dynamic grid. To start, let's pick a painting. How about this one by John Constable, titled The Hate? You don't like it. Why not? It's boring. Okay, well, let's try this then. Well, good, I'm glad you approve. This is a work by Eugene Delacroix, titled Death of Sardanapalus. In this case, let's start by determining the ratio. To do so, we need the size of the work. This work itself is a regular. But, if we convert the meters to feet, it comes in at about 12.8 feet by 16.2 feet. For simplicity's sake, we'll just round these figures and determine that the work is approximately 13 feet by 16 feet. Taking the long side of the painting, which is 16 feet, and dividing it by the shorter side, 13 feet, gives us a ratio of 1.23. This is not a perfect ratio per se, and we took some liberties with this calculation, but it is strikingly close to the ratio attained by taking the square root of phi, which gives us a ratio of 1.27. Thus, this tells us that the work is, more or less, in that classical realm of compositional proportion. Knowing this has little to do with the armature's construction, but it does give us knowledge of the proportional relationships found within the painting structure. Keep in mind, too, that we immediately know that due to the proportion's close proximity to the ratio of 1, the Baroque and sinister angles will be steep. To start building the armature, let's first determine those Baroque and sinister diagonals. Essentially, we are making an X across the entirety of the painting. Now before we go on, let's look at this piece that we're analyzing. Look at that alignment of the main subject along that sinister diagonal line. Aligning objects along this line adds tension to the work, as the Baroque angle is more readable due to people's inclination towards reading text from left to right. Thus, we already see the artist establishing a sense of mood and tension within the work. The next step in developing an armature is to build the reciprocal lines off of the Baroque and sinister angles. These reciprocal lines always intersect the Baroque and sinister diagonals at a 90 degree angle. To create them, start from the corners and ensure that the lines cross the sinister and Baroque diagonals at 90 degrees. This is essential. Notice that two of the lines start at the beginning and end of the Baroque diagonal, and the other two do the same for the sinister diagonal. Due to this, they are named accordingly. Those lines which start from the sinister corners are the S reciprocals, or sinister reciprocals. 
and those which stem from the Baroque corners are the B reciprocals, or Baroque reciprocals. Our final step is to use the intersections of the previous lines to map out the horizontal and vertical grid lines. We now have the basic armature, and a few interesting developments have been made through the creation of this structure. First, those reciprocal lines are named such for a particular reason. The lines allow us to determine the location of the reciprocal rectangles within the grid. Well, Al, a reciprocal rectangle has the same aspect ratio as the larger outer rectangle. This helps us visualize the mapping of the space within a composition, allowing for us to understand how the artist used dynamic design. These reciprocal rectangles can be found in many points within the compositional structure of a painting. For example, if we drop a line vertically from where a reciprocal line would exit the frame, then a reciprocal rectangle is formed. Keep in mind, though, that this vertical borderline is usually different than the vertical grid lines formed prior. In our case, this isn't true, however. Once these reciprocal rectangles have been established, an identical grid to the one used for the full canvas or mother rectangle can be recreated within these reciprocal rectangles, further developing our analysis of how the painting is broken down. Look at the four intersection points between the reciprocal lines and the Baroque and sinister angles. These points are really important, as they are called the polar points. They form the corners of another reciprocal rectangle located centrally within the grid. Yeah, Al, just like in five grids and the rule of thirds. How do you know about that? What do you mean from our lesson on them? I don't remember talking about this with you before. I agree, let's just keep going. Something is definitely weird though. As we said, any of the reciprocal rectangles can be broken down with identical armatures to the mother rectangle. And this trend can be infinitely repeated. So, you as an analyst must be logical in how far to take these breakdowns of the visual information as there will be a point where the breakdowns will serve no meaningful purpose to the analysis of the work. Usually, a maximum of two or three iterations is plenty for most works. It is also important to know that creating an armature from scratch is often the best solution to ensuring that the work is analyzed properly, as every rectangle is different and the resulting armatures will also be different. When dealing with perfect examples such as root rectangles and the golden rectangle, we can easily predict the breakdown and use armatures that are predetermined. This, however, is not true of irregular work, and you may find that you need to stack, rotate, or overlap root rectangles and armatures to fully analyze these types of works. Another reason for developing scratch-made armatures is that they compensate for the imprecision of online images. Sometimes the aspect ratios change when digitizing artwork, though the work itself is the same, provided that it was not cropped at any point. Creating an adapted armature will still allow for analysis of the work, albeit slightly inaccurate depending on the amount of skewing that exists. Okay, Al, so now that we have built our armature, let's use it to analyze this painting in more depth. But before we do, maybe we should know what the painting is about. The painting tells the narrative of King Sardanapalus, who, upon his defeat, decided that rather than surrendering, he would eradicate everything in what essentially was to be a huge funeral pyre destroying anything of value within his kingdom. Thus we see the king in the process of having his prized possessions slaughtered and destroyed right before his own death. With that in mind, the first place that we should start is by analyzing the work with his basic armature in place. Remember that the key points within the composition are likely to fall on the intersections of the grid lines, and that the four points that make up the central reciprocal rectangle are the most important. Looking at the grid shape, this painting follows a near-perfect root rectangle configuration thus making our analysis a little bit more predictable. The most obvious feature of our painting is one that we mentioned when establishing our Baroque and sinister angles. The sinister angle dominates this composition, and the use of a root rectangle configuration makes this angle very steep. We've already identified that this composition along the sinister diagonal establishes a great deal of tension within the work. This is echoed in the visuals as well, with the chaotic iconography and desperate figures strewn about. This compositional angle's purpose is further bookmarked by its steepness. The steepness of that sinister angle also serves to tell us more about the main figure within the painting. Sardanapalus sits high on that sinister angle, adding to the pull and energy of the figure in general. 
But his placement higher above the majority of the figures and the fact that he is draped in light robes builds his significance in the hierarchy of the painting as well. He reclines and looks onward lazily, as if unaffected by the chaos around him. The tension of his placement on that sinister angle is compensated and balanced by the gaze of the concubine being accosted by the soldier at the foot of his bed. He meets her eye to eye and does not react. Likewise, the cropped male figure to her right with his outstretched hand, helps to further establish the sinister angle as he reaches towards the king and again meets his disinterested gaze. The Baroque angle is established most fully in the narrative about the heavily adorned horse being slain in the lower right corner. The horse's gaze and placement are low on that Baroque angle, aligning perfectly with the thigh of its killer. Echoing this is the horse's lead and the man's tensed arm. The placement of this narrative so low on that Baroque angle keeps it from dominating the scene. The only other artifact that aligns with the Baroque angle is the concubine's hand in the back of the bed as it's raised slightly and lines up along the line perfectly. Now that we've looked at the most obvious angles, let's start to look at the eyes of the painting or the points of interest. These, as we've already stated, fall at the intersections of the grid lines within the armature. On the polar points, the four points of the central reciprocal rectangle, we see four important narratives taking place. Starting in the top left corner of that central rectangle, the point aligns with the face of the dead concubine lying at the feet of the king. She drapes over the bed, and the artist wants us to focus on her, as she tells us that this painting is about death and destruction. To the right of her, on the upper right point of the rectangle, we see another narrative playing out. In this scene, the concubine is not yet dead. The point of interest falls centrally on her back. The point of her body that has collided with the bed and prevents her from escaping her impending execution by the soldier who looms over her and draws his knife. Directly below her is arguably the most important point of interest. This point falls between the reclining concubine at the direct foot of the bed and the concubine who is being brutally stabbed to death while gazing at the king. The reclining concubine is the only person who engages with us by meeting our gaze directly, and she seems as disinterested as the king in the horrors surrounding her, an indication that may clue us into her status within the king's court. She has either accepted her fate, or perhaps she is so close to the king that she too agrees with his decision to destroy everything that he loves. This realization may indicate that she may be the king's first concubine, whose status was closer to the status of a wife. The other narrative that falls just to the right of this eye is what truly makes this point so important, though. Here we see a concubine in the process of being murdered. As we noted before, her gaze meets the king's and adds to the tension of the piece, while balancing his placement high on that sinister angle. The final polar point, which falls on the lower left corner of the central rectangle, falls directly on the corner of the bed. It helps to establish the elephant heads that adorn the corners of the king's bed, and helps to introduce the narrative of the horse being slain, as it intersects a point of tension in the figure's body and aligns with the trailing part of the horse's red lead. Moving outward, we can analyze the secondary intersections of the gridded lines. Let's start by analyzing the four eyes that appear horizontally and vertically around the central rectangle. To the top of the rectangle, we see an intersection which falls directly in the middle of a concubine that seems to be suspended in some way, with her back arched in an almost S shape, a common shape found throughout the painting as it represents the impending flames later in the story. To the bottom of the central rectangle, the intersection falls on the top of a pile of treasure, indicating the immense wealth of the king. Note the S shape again here, within the treasures. To the left of the center rectangle, we find an eye which falls on the lower body of the dead concubine mentioned previously. This establishes her importance further, and directing our eye to this region serves again to introduce the narrative below with the horse. This is in part due to the great deal of contrast present between the dark-skinned figure with the horse and the pale color of the concubine. To the right of the center rectangle is an eye which aligns with the hand of the soldier as it yields the knife to kill the concubine meeting the king's gaze. Another form of reinforcement for the main narrative points of the story. Before we move outward to the last four eyes in the painting, let's look at the central intersection of the painting. You'll note that this intersection falls just above the elephant's ear onto the bed's surface, which is essentially a void of negative space within the work. What do you think the significance of this is, Al? No, Al. Delacroix did not run out of ideas. Wow. It's up to you. Don't what do you mean, don't blink? Don't look away and and don't who's that on your blink. monitor? Good luck.
Right. What was I saying? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so to answer your question now, the center eye or intersection falls on the bed in that empty space because Delacroix has created an enclosure. You see the circle pattern that connects the figures and draws the eyes towards the center of the narrative? These are quite sophisticated aspects of compositional design. But you already knew that. At least I thought you did. How did I get here again? Where were we? Oh yes, we just talked about the elliptical enclosure being used in the painting. Let's move outward now and look at the last four intersections. These all fall on the horizontal grid lines, just to the side of the polar points. Here we see some minimal reinforcement in these intersections. Let's start by looking at the eye to the left of the top left polar point. This falls close to the elbow of the dead concubine. Its purpose seems to be twofold. Firstly, it pulls attention to the narrative happening to the left of the dead concubine. Here we see a man committing suicide and the body of another concubine covering her face. This point also reinforces the horizontal thrust of that grid line which grounds the king's side table and connects the body of the dead concubine with the other concubine's impending death and with the outstretched hand of the male concubine who reinforces that sinister angle. To the right of the upper right polar point, we see another eye. However, this falls into negative space within the painting and serves only to again reinforce the horizontal thrust that connects the figures that we just discussed. Directly below this is another point of interest. This eye falls between the bodies of the soldier and the concubine being killed. This eye again acts as a reinforcer to this scene as it is pivotal to the narrative being told. It also serves to emphasize the arching of the woman's back as she struggles against her assailant, adding to the drama unfolding in this miniature narrative. Our final eye within the basic armature falls to the left of the lower left polar point. This eye is placed directly between the horse's nose and the figure who is attempting to kill the horse. Like with the eye on the opposite side of the canvas, this acts as both a reinforcement for the narrative and emphasis of the tension between the figures within that narrative. With that, we have uncovered some of the compositional strategies being employed by Delacroix. We, however, are not done. This can be further broken down by analyzing the grids within the reciprocal rectangles found throughout the painting. I think we'll skip that though, Al. Honestly, I feel a bit wizzy, and there is something else that I want to discuss with you briefly. Good, I'm glad that you agree. By the way, what's with all the marks on you? What marks? The lines. You know, the tick marks. Uh, never mind. So the last thing I wanted to discuss with you was this. The painting we just analyzed was a root Phi work, or at least so close that it was almost perfect. Due to that, the armature was very close to that of a square work. However, it still offered a good deal of dynamic interaction among the painted elements. You see, Al, square works provide artists with added challenges and can do the same for those who try to analyze these works without understanding the unique qualities of a perfect square. Squares are in fact a root rectangle. The ratio is actually just one. A perfect square is a one to one ratio. Due to this, the armature of a square is just the X created by the Baroque and sinister angles. The corner to corner diagonal and reciprocal lines are exactly the same, meaning that the only eye within a square painting is in the dead center of the canvas. As you might have guessed, this is not exactly ideal for laying out a work or analyzing work on a square substrate. The workaround for this is identical to the workaround for imperfect rectangles that you might encounter in your analyses, and that is to stack different root rectangles into the composition. This allows for more dynamic compositional strategies if you are designing a work, and allows for a more complex analysis if you're analyzing a work. For squares, the easiest technique is to take two root four rectangles and stack them on top of each other. This opens up many more options for both the artist and analyzer. For fun, let's look at how this system breaks down on three famous album covers. Remember, we mentioned earlier about how square compositions fit nicely within this genre. Albums tend to be 12 by 12 inches in size, making the perfect squares. This means that the artists designing these covers must take that into consideration. Just so you know, Al, I tried to pick albums with more artistic covers rather than the more graphic covers that are often seen. So my choices might not be as iconic as some others, but they serve our purpose here. First, let's look at this cover to Meatloaf's Bat Out of Hell album. This work follows many of the same compositional principles as the death of Sardanapalus. The motorcycle is set on that sinister diagonal, 
with the central eye landing on the rider's upper thigh. This gives a sense of tension to the work overall. Two eyes fall on the motorcycle's front tire, and a third falls on the front shock and steering stem, grounding this part of the motorcycle in the left part of the frame. This is important, as this work also does something interesting in terms of its gridded columns. Notice that the figure and central part of the motorcycle fall squarely in the center column, as does the title of the album. On the right-hand column, the bat and steeple take up the central focus, with the secondary text for the album appearing in the upper right corner. Finally, we have the left column, where the wheel occupies the most visual emphasis, and the cemetery occupies the lower left-hand corner, balancing the text in the upper right. In this case, the artist decided to use the sinister angle to build tension, use the columns to organize visual information, and center the subject squarely in the frame. This is one solution to the somewhat simplified layout scheme found in square compositions. Another is to use a setup like the one used in Elton John's Goodbye Yellow Brick Road album. Here we have the subject set up along the broke angle. It feels far more approachable as a result. Elton John's arm mirrors this Baroque angle, and the central eye falls upon the wrist of this arm. Another eye falls on the figure's other wrist as well, a trend similarly played out in the placement of compositional eyes near his feet. This likely served to emphasize the ruby red platforms that the figure is wearing, adding to the theme of the yellow brick road. Like with Meatloaf's album art, this composition also uses gridded columns, but differently. The vertical line that makes up the right side of the central column falls directly down the figure's right side. This reinforces the figure and works in a similar way to the rule of thirds or phi grids, in emphasizing the figure as the primary subject of the piece. Likewise, the vertical lines of the grid emphasize the vertical lines of the wall that Elton John is stepping through. In a similar fashion, the horizontal lines emphasize the breaking of the visual perspective into the scene and reinforces the edges of the wall's borders and sidewalk. On a final note, you might notice that this work feels cyclical in its construction. That is due to the fact that circles fit perfectly into squares, meaning that there are two circles at play within this composition. This larger one that falls into the confines of the overall composition, and this smaller one which is slightly offset within the borders of the wall which Elton John is stepping into. This use of cyclical enclosures helps to add a great deal of visual unity to the overall work as a result. Our final album cover is likely the most iconic of the bunch. This is the cover to the Beatles' Abbey Road album. Out of all the covers, I think that this is the most striking to look at with an armature in place. A few things immediately jump out at me. Let's start by looking at the three eyes that cut vertically through the center of the composition. One falls at the top of the crosswalk, one falls centrally within the road, in the middle ground, and one falls centrally in the sky. These serve to reinforce the overall structure of the entire album cover. They pull the eye in and back, reiterating the strong sense of one-point perspective at play here. Like with our other album art examples, the grid itself plays a huge role in the establishment of the compositional interactions occurring within. Let's first look at the top half of the composition. The left column houses the dark tree line, which is reflected by the trees in the right column. The houses in that right column also line up directly with that reciprocal line. The central column holds the central focus of this part of the image as well, with the road receding into the lower half of the central column. This also breaks down nicely in terms of rows, where everything balances into each individual module of the overall grid. This same sort of balance is seen in the lower half of the composition containing the band members. Here we see that two of the figures, Ringo Starr and Paul McCartney, are centrally located. In the right column is, of course, John Lennon, and to the left, in his own column, is George Harrison. The upper row of the lower compositional half is balanced by the four figures themselves, with each figure appearing from the knee up fitting perfectly into the frame. The bottom row contains their feet, and more importantly is taken up fully by the crosswalk, which has its top falling perfectly along the horizontal grid line. One of the most striking aspects about this composition, though, has to be the eyes in the lower half of the composition. Notice that all the eyes miss the beetles altogether, with the exception of a few that fall very near them, and one which falls on the back of John Lennon. Generally, these eyes land in the negative spaces around and between the band members. This adds an interesting element to the composition, as it emphasizes the space, but in doing so, emphasizes the figures which are surrounded by that space. In essence, this album cover feels as if the band is secondary to the surroundings, which only makes them stand out more because they fit into the space so securely. 
It's an interesting approach, and arguably one of the reasons that this particular cover is so iconic. Good question, Al. Yes, these same principles can be applied to abstract works as well, especially works which deal with shapes and lines. The best way to get an idea of compositional structures being used in paintings is simply to lay armatures over top of various paintings and images and see what you can find. You might be surprised just how well planned out many classical and contemporary works really are. So what do you think, Al? Do you get armatures? Who am I? I'm... Um... You know, I don't really know. Actually, I don't even know why I'm down here. Perhaps I should go lie down. At home. Whatever that is. We'll see a doctor. Doctor, doctor, doctor who? Doctor.